take these broken wings and learn to fly again, learn to live so free. When we hear the voices sing, the book of love will open up and let us in. Tear. Room. Welcome to the Rosebush. My name is Rose. Or Allie. Allie Rose. Doesn't really matter. Whatever you're feeling. I'll answer both. This is a continuation of our storytelling with Run. That's what I'm calling it. Um, and this is just another shameless plug. Email me. Email me at rosecosmoswriter at gmail.com with your stories. Uh, and let me know if I have permission to use your name or how you want to be identified or permission to be identified as a whole. Send me your stories. Short stories, long stories, personal stories, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. Just as I said in my uh, previous videos, be respectful. Be respectful, okay? <laughs> uh, don't be weird. Don't be gross. Don't be nasty. Don't be hateful. Uh, you know, if you're going to email me, make it worth my while, okay? All right, because I'm interested. I'm interested to read your stories because I will be sharing some of my stories. Uh, and I would love, I would love to start this new segment. I don't know what I'm going to call it. I don't know. I was, I was thinking something silly like story time. Story time with Rose. Story time with Ellie. Uh, the story corner. It just, none of it sounds good. But I will know when I know. So, what I know <clears throat> is, this is chapter three of Ren's story. So, if you haven't watched chapter one or chapter two, please go do so. Preferably watch my reaction videos of that. And if you're new here, if you're new to my bush, welcome. Welcome to my bush. It's great. It's phenomenal. It's flourishing. It's uh, beautiful. Uh, and I thank you for being here. I'm grateful for your time. And I would love for you to stick around. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, let's grow. Let us grow together. Because growth is very important. And as I say, it happens one thorn at a time. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time just uh, shooting the shit. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, I don't know why it's got spinny wheel. I don't know why it's doing that. I don't know why it's like that. Why is it like that? I guess I need My to therapist play. was scowling at Sorry about that. Let's do it again. My therapist was scowling at my weekly anxiety and depression scores like a detective trying to crack a particularly stubborn case. There were no signs of improvement and the scores followed no real measurable pattern that were consistent with bipolar. After nearly two years of talk therapy and taking enough medications to fill a pharmacy, he sat down with me and he dropped the bombshell that he didn't think that I had bipolar. In fact, he said that he didn't think that I had depression at all. And it was a very odd thing to be stripped of an identity in an instant. The reality was that a 20 minute in and out consultation two years ago led to two years of swallowing pills that I never needed and devoting so much of my time to managing the condition that I never actually had. The emotions inside me swirled around like a mismatched soup on one hand, I was full of anger and I was bitter, bitter about the whole situation, but I was also hopeful that this new path could offer me with the relief that I desperately needed. He told me he was going to refer me to an ME clinic in Bath. I'd never heard of it before, but instinctively true to character, I started researching it online as soon as I got home. Apparently, ME is the medical equivalent of a choose-your-own-adventure book, with tiredness as the only consistent plotline. There were no universally accepted reasons as to why the fuck it existed in the first place. It seemed it was largely accepted to be a post-viral condition, but that was all speculative because there were no clear consensus in the medical community what ME even was. The defining character characteristic was a tiredness that wouldn't go away with rest. I could relate to this. In fact, I could more than relate to it. For anyone lucky enough to have not have experienced this, if you want an idea of what it's like, force yourself to stay awake for three nights in a row. During this time, eat the food that makes you feel terrible, and in this sleep-deprived state, exercise until your muscles give out. By the third day, you'll have a small insight into living with this condition. 
during the years post stem cell transplant where I recovered a lot of my health and functionality. I remember getting COVID and thinking it was a walk in the park compared to the first year of my illness. The difference was COVID lasted about a week. The thick of my illness lasted eight years and it only was getting worse. I pinned a lot of hope on going to that first visit at the ME clinic. It was a six month waiting list, God bless NHS wait times, but I felt excited to be surrounded by people who would understand me, where I could climb out of this nightmare but my hopes were pretty quickly crushed during that first visit. I remember walking into a space that looked like a disused classroom where a bunch of people on chairs were sitting around in circles like Alcoholics Anonymous. I could feel a sense of camaraderie and that we all felt like dog shit. We were all confused and we were all desperately wanting to feel better. I believe at the time I was probably the youngest in the group. The group leader waddled in and handed us all a booklet that looked like a school timetable. She then sat us down and told about this new revolutionary technique called pacing where you write down and track everything that you do in a day and then you do it less. And then with time, do it more again. The theory being that you have a limited bucket of energy compared to normal people and you need to protect that and gradually push it. I thought this sounded pretty stupid so I raised my hand. I told her about the pain in my body. I told her that my muscles twitched constantly. I told her that my bones ached. I told her that my mouth was dry. I couldn't focus that some days they'd be without mercy and I'd be trapped in bed for the whole day. But the days that I wasn't, I wanted to make the most of it. I wanted to breathe the air and I wanted to live. She told me she understood it's hard, but she didn't really offer more than that. She just pointed at the booklet and told me to follow it. I asked her about things like heavy metal poisoning, about chronically reactivating viruses, about defective mitochondria, about all the things that I read that were linked to chronic fatigue. But she just raised an eyebrow, looked at me like I was a hypochondriac and told me she knew nothing about those things. I remember walking out of the building feeling disheartened and defeated, so much so that my legs buckled as I was walking home. I began to sob, sob uncontrollably on the side of the road. An old woman knelt down to comfort me and asked me what was wrong. I didn't even really know how to explain, so I just told her that I missed my friend. Despite my scepticism, I stuck to the programme for at least half a year and I kept going for my periodic visits to the clinic and it did jack shit. In fact, I got worse. I was always getting worse. One thing that particularly struck me about the ME support groups was the pure desperation and confusion. With most other conditions, you're given a diagnosis, a prognosis of whether it's gonna kill you and what you can do to manage it or cure it. With ME, you don't get that. You get an indeterminately long sentence to purgatory. You feel worse than you've ever felt in your whole life and you're given no explanation as to why and no signpost pointing the way out. There was no selection bias to the people suffering. Members of the group were anything from esteemed ex-lawyers to single parents to former athletes. One thing I can say, these people were for the most part all extremely driven and collectively mourning their old lives. There's a stigma that because ME's predominant presentation of symptoms is tiredness, that its victims are just being lazy. I can tell you firsthand that me and every single person I've met with genuine ME would rather run a thousand marathons and have to live another week with the tiredness and the unrelenting fatigue. We were at war with our tiredness, trying desperately to escape it. And some of us would go to extreme lengths to turn ourselves into guinea pigs to try and find ways out. Suicide was pretty common in those online support groups. It was around this time I was swallowed into the music industry. I was out busking on the streets one day and I noticed this sketchy, good looking Mauritian guy with his arms crossed watching me really intensely as though he was studying every lyric coming out of my mouth. He approached me and asked me if the songs I was singing were mine. I said they were. A big smile was painted across his face and he told me he just finished recording Plan B's latest record, which turned out to be The Defamation of Strickland Banks, one of my favourite albums of all time. He was looking for a new project to sink his teeth into and he asked me if I'd come to London to record. We got into it. The whole time I felt dreadful, but this was a lifelong dream materialising in front of my eyes. So bit by bit, when I could, I'd get the train to London and start chipping away at my first ever album. I didn't really let on how I was feeling during this time because I didn't want to sabotage it. There would be times I'd finish up in the vocal booth after doing the take, excuse myself to go to the toilet, throw up from the dizziness I was experiencing, sometimes with specks of blood, and then I'd go back and pretend that nothing had happened. I'd be sitting around with the whole room spinning and would pretend I was fine. There was only so long that I was able to keep this up. Eric told me it'd be a cool idea for me to start going to industry showcases and start building buzz. Performing live like this was a whole new level of taxing that I wasn't ready for, but I was so ferociously ambitious that I just ploughed through. 
The usual way it would go is I'd be in the back of Charlie's car, the whole world would be spinning. I'd be trying my best to sleep in it all day, parked up outside of whatever venue or pub it was in London, trying to conserve energy for the show. Sometimes I cry a little before. I just wanted to say that his level of masking is incredible. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not just masking, it's self-preservation, it's shame, it's fear, it's everything. Like, there's no way he would want this producer to know he's sick with this opportunity that just fell in his lap like this. So, of course, you have to hide, which makes everything so much worse anyway because of the anxiety of hiding. I, I'm just so in awe of this human being. And if you're not in awe of this human being, then are we watching the same thing? Sometimes I'd cry a little before I performed. My whole body would be burning. Then I'd brush it off and I'd get on stage and I'd perform as best I could. People would come up to me at the end, pat me on the back. I'd smile and pretend to be charismatic. Then I'd get back in the car and i wish I was in bed and have to endure a three hour drive back to Bath from London. There was only a few shows where I could keep pretending. I'd usually be trying to disguise the fact that my body was trembling through the fatigue and pain. Mm -hmm. Eventually I started crying mid set. It became blindingly obvious to everyone working with me during that time that something was very wrong. I told Eric that I needed to take some time out. My plan was to live at home with my mum for a month maximum, get my energy back and come and finish the record. That one month turned into two months, turned into three months, turned into six months. I pushed myself to total burnout. The distance led to me and that angel breaking up, in part because it was difficult to navigate a relationship when you have so much brain fog and I didn't know what it was well enough to be able to explain it to her at the time. With a loud thud, I'd been jolted out of a Shakespearean storyline, I lost the record deal and I couldn't get out of bed. My friends from Trick the Fox never really called to check up on me. It felt like the whole world was moving at lightning speed without me. I had this amazing opportunity right in front of me and I was chained to the floor. I was alone, I was sick. I wished that my condition would get it over with and kill me, but it wouldn't and it felt cruel that it wouldn't. It just let me rot in bed. The whole world would continue to turn and I would rot. In the next episode, I'm going to tell you about a fight with a television and losing my anal virginity to an 80-year-old man. <gasps> Stay tuned for that. Oh, my God. Ren, you were assaulted. Posed by a time bomb for an author Like pigs to the slaughter A symphony of self-doubt sings out Breath starts getting shorter Running water It's the state that I wish to become Instead concrete envelops my movement And I'm rendered deaf and dumb Unable to heed the advice of others Don't tell me things will get better Cause so far things haven't gotten better I've got the sweater Poster child bipolar ADHD therapist wet dream I don't want to talk about my father I don't want to talk about my dead friend I don't want to talk about myself I'm sick of talking about myself I'm sick of talking about myself And realising that talking about myself never ever helps Still, I call for help Cause I really want help But the pills didn't seem to help And the therapist didn't seem to help But still, I want help I've danced with the devil in hell I've sat in a prisonless cell And here I always dwell In this prison in myself I do this thing when my mind travels back to the golden age You know those times where you were carefree and everything was golden The golden age You know those times where everything was golden Where you were carefree and everything was golden The hardest thing I ever had to do Was come to terms with the fact that That time never really existed I've always felt so fucking detached and broken, bruised and mismatched. I find it hard to relax, living under the cracks. Tried to fill in the gaps, lying here on my back. Still, 
I can't find it Sense of peace in my mind declined it Pulse increase and my sweat combines With a feeling so deep I fall inside it Depression, I hate you Depression, your constant oppression Respond with aggression They say depression brings you lessons Constant stressing conceals blessings You will grow in broken settings Fuck those lessons, fuck depression I've been living in your shadow for so long that I forgot how I can shine How I can find a refuge in my mind How am I meant to sit here and unwind The planets align I feel like I'm cursed Feel like I'm cursed to just be here to hurt Feel like I'm cursed to just be here to bleed with my death Demons been feeling this way since birth Depression, I hate you 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 That's, um, you know if you're somebody that's, if you're someone that's never dealt with depression, that's great. <laughs> Truly. I'm very happy for you. Um, it's not the same as you lost a loved one and now you're depressed about it. It's not the same. That's grief. That's sadness. That's normal. You know, there's times where I have felt so down. I have felt so detached. I have felt so much. I have felt the weight of everything inside my brain pressing on my heart and soul. And I have have felt like I've been like I, I was falling apart. I have been so low. That I have thought about leaving. I've been so low and I have felt so incredibly lonely and unsupported and just so alone that I thought there's no one that's, there's no one I, one, there's no one I trust enough to take care of my cat. So I'll take her with me. And that's really dark. Because I don't trust anybody enough in my life to take care of her if something were to happen to me. Whether it's by design or self-infliction. Uh, and then when you see yourself on the other side of that depression, that dark hole where you there's no walls or windows there's no way that you see out but then it lifts and I say it lifts because I do in fact I struggle with sad seasonal affective disorder and it's really hard come that winter time uh it's really difficult um, but I'm hoping this coming year it'll be better because I'm not working at home anymore. So <laughs> I'm hoping the sad is better. But in general, having those thoughts and feelings and feeling so incredibly out of control. I, I, can't, I, don't, I don't even know what to say. I don't, I don't have much else to say about that because... If you struggle with depression, I don't have to verbalize it because you just know. You just understand. You just, you get it. You're in the club. And I really, I, I struggle with others who don't understand. You know, like it's one thing for you to not have ever struggled with that. And you understand, and you can understand and sympathize and empathize and be there for those people struggling. And it's on another hand to be someone that just doesn't get it and doesn't want to get it, doesn't even want 
doesn't even want to go down that hole. But I'm here to tell you that we really need help. We need support. We need compassion. Because we can't pull ourselves out by ourselves. It's too deep. So we need help. We need, we need your help. So that's it. <laughs> I will preach and say it over and over again about empathy, compassion, understanding. Uh, I just, I really have, I'm at this point in my life where I have a really hard time relating to other people or, or just vibing with people that are not that are not that way because I am a person that has so much love for my fellow human so much understanding and talking with my therapist I I give uh, one of my weaknesses is that I am too understanding I'm too empathetic I give too I give people too much grace because of my level of understanding. But ultimately, hear me. Just because your behavior is explainable doesn't mean it's acceptable. And that comes from somebody who, who has struggled for a long time, who now knows why they are the way they are and is continuing, continuing, continuing to work on themselves, herself, to put in the work. So if you're someone joining me today watching this and you're not doing anything to work on you and you criticize other people, for their faults. I'm going to go primary school on you all and talk about the point in the finger because you got three pointing back at you. <laughs> so just think about that. There's a severe mental health crisis going on in the world right now and no one is caring. No one understands and no one wants to. They just want to just keep on, you know, lallygagging about things. But there's a real problem in the world. And this is just me, just tangent. This is just a tangent. Anyway, I'm not going to continue moving forward. Just talk about it in the comments. Talk about anything and everything. Talk about how you feel. Like I said, send me your stories. Email me. That information will be in the, in the description. Uh, anyway, I thank you so much for joining me today. I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your subscription. If you are, I hope you come back to the bush because it's great here and growth happens one thorn at a time. Let's take care. Bye.